In this third lecture about equilibrium, we're going to learn how to calculate KEQ, the equilibrium constant. Um, we're going to learn how to calculate it. We're going to learn how to predict how it will change according to Le Chatelier's principle. And we're going to learn how to use it to calculate the concentration of reactants and products that reach equilibrium. The equilibrium constant, abbreviated as KEQ, is the ratio of the concentrations of the products compared to the reactants in a system at equilibrium. There are many different K values that you will learn eventually if you take college chemistry. There, for example, there's Ka, the acid base constant or acid dissociation constant. There's Ksp, the solubility constant. So this is just one of many Ks and the um, subscript Eq is telling us that we're looking at a system at equilibrium. So at equilibrium, when the concentration of the products is equal to the concentration of reactants, it's going to be a ratio of 1 to 1, meaning it'll be a fraction of 1 over 1, which just equals 1. So Keq is equal to 1. If there is a larger concentration of products than reactants at equilibrium, Keq will be greater than 1 because the fraction will have a larger number on top than on the bottom. And if the products is less than reactants, it will be less than 1 because there will be a larger number on the bottom compared to the top. Keq is found by calculating what's called an equilibrium expression. So if you have a generic reaction where substance A and substance B react to form substance C and substance D, and the mole ratio is represented by lowercase letters A, B, C, and D. The equilibrium expression is in general the, reaction, the, um, the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants, but specifically it's going to be looking at the concentration of product C to the power of the number of moles of C times product D times the num to the power of number of moles of D. That's going to be divided of the multiplied product of substance A's concentration to the power of the number of its moles times the amount of substance B times uh, to the power of its moles. And the reason we use the mole ratio coefficients as exponents is because each of the reactants will exponentially decrease at a certain rate and it depends on the number of moles. So you'll see this in the examples that we go through. So in this first example, we can calculate AQ by setting up a reaction um, equation and using that equation to set up an equilibrium expression. So if we start off with one mole of N2 and one mole of H2 sealed in a flask at 500 degrees Celsius, if we allow them to equal come to equilibrium and we know that their concentrations at equilibrium are 0.921 moles per liter or molars, 0.763 molar and 0.157 molar, we can then calculate a Q by filling those numbers into the equilibrium expression. So note the equilibrium expression. We have the concentration of the only one product, NH3, and it is squared because there is two NH3s in the balanced equation. That's going to be divided by the concentration of N2 and that's to the power of 1 because the coefficient of N2 is 1 times the concentration of H2 cubed because the mole uh, coefficient for H2 is 3. The reason it's a 1 and a 3 is this is saying that for every one mole or molecule of N2 three molecules of H2 are required to combine in such a ratio as to make an NH3. And in fact, two NH3s are being made. So the rate at which N2 is used up, if we say that rate is X, the rate at which H2 is used up is going to be three times as fast, or 3X, because you need three H2s for every one N2. You could also say that the rate at which NH3 is made is twice the speed or twice the rate at which N2 is used up because for every one molecule of N2, you can make two molecules of NH3. So that's why we need to use squared and cubed for our expression. When we fill in those numbers, we can square them, solve the algebra, and basically we would end up with 0.061. Going back in the notes, we look and we see that when equilibrium, or KEQ, is less than 1, that means that equilibrium is favoring the reactants. 
which means we had a larger number on the bottom for the concentration of reactants than we did to the top. When a system at equilibrium is disturbed, as we've already learned in the previous notes, um, the equilibrium is going to shift and when it shifts to favor either reactants, this may or may not change the reaction's KEQ. When you have a change in temperature or a change in pressure, whatever shift you see is likely to cause a change in KEQ because one side or other of the reaction is going to be favored. However, when you are changing the concentration of a reactant or product, more than likely KEQ will stay about the same or exactly the same because the atoms that you are adding or removing from the system will be redistributed to offset the change. So for example, if you have an equilibrium expression that comes down to 1 over 2 and you add something and the expression changes to 2 over 4, both of those numbers are equal to 1 half. So KEQ roughly stays the same. Here's an example of this. If we use the same system of nitrogen and hydrogen making ammonia, and I tell you that it's an exothermic reaction, what effect will increasing the temperature have? We previously calculated KEQ was 0.061 at 500 degrees Celsius. So according to Le Chatelier's principle, when you increase the temperature, that means you are adding energy, and equilibrium is going to shift to reduce the added energy, which in this case is going to mean it's going to shift to favor the reactants. Equilibrium will shift left or in reverse. So KEQ will become smaller because the overall concentration of products is going to decrease, the overall concentrations is going to increase. So you will have a bigger number on the bottom and a smaller number on top. We can plug in some hypothetical numbers to actually prove this. So let's say that when we shift towards the reactants, N is going to increase by some amount X. H2 is going to increase by 3 times X because of the mole ratio. And NH3 will decrease by 2 times X, again, because the mole ratio is 1 to 3 to 2. So if N2 is going to decrease, or I'm sorry, it's going to increase up to 1.421, H2 proportionally increases up to 2.263 and NH3 proportionally decreases to 0.057 because of that shifting due to the change in temperature. If we plug in these new numbers, we end up with the new KEQ as being 1.97 times 10 to the negative 4. This new KEQ is far, far, far smaller than 0.061. And that confirms what we had just thought, which is that KEQ will decrease. We can look at this animation by McGraw-Hill at this website, and we can plug in a temperature change, and we can actually look at the numbers or concentration of each of the reactants and products and calculate how the system shifts in order to, um, to look at, a, in order to adjust for a temperature change. And we can see how with the new numbers, if you plug them into the equilibrium expression, you'll be able to calculate, in fact, that it does increase or it does decrease depending on which direction equilibrium is shifting. If we look at example where we change the pressure, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the system will shift to relieve the added pressure to go to the side of fewer moles. So in this case, we have 1 plus 3 is 4 moles of reactants versus 2 moles of products. So we know from the previous notes that equilibrium is going to shift to the right to favor the products. Products are part of the numerator, so KEQ will become larger. Let's throw some hypothetical numbers in there. If the, here's the original equilibrium numbers, and we said equilibrium is going to shift to the products, then we're going to see the amount of the reactants N2 and H2 are going to decrease. So we can see that it's decreased by approximately 0.02 or three times that amount, 0.06. And NH3 is proportionally going to increase by two times the amount. So if we plug in these new numbers, we get 0.124. The new KEQ is greater than the original KEQ of 0.061, which confirms that KEQ increases when we shift towards the products. 
Again, you can go to the same website and look at this um, animation they have where you can increase the pressure or decrease the pressure. And you can use the amount of concentrations at equilibrium and after equilibrium has been shifted by increasing or decrease pressure. And you can confirm for yourself how equilibrium will shift to increase or decrease depending on which way it is shifting to the left or to the right. Finally, we can look at how changing the amount of a concentration. So for in this case, if we add NH3. So if we add NH3, the equilibrium amount is immediately increased. So we used to have um, NH3 at a certain concentration. If we add more, it's immediately going to increase. Then we need to take into consideration Le Chatelier's principle which says that the system will shift to redistribute or to go away from the added NH3, which we know means it's going to shift to the left to favor the reactants. So KEQ is going to remain the same because NH3 will increase and then it will decrease as the system is redistributing some of the N and H atoms to become N2 and H2. If we throw in hypothetical numbers and we say originally the amount of NH3 was 0.157, if one mole, for example, of NH3 is added, that takes that amount to 0.257. As equilibrium shifts, we're going to proportionally increase the amount of N2 and H2 compared to what they were originally. And by proportionally, by using the mole ratio, we're going to decrease NH3. If we calculate the new KEQs using our new adjusted numbers, we get 0.065, which if you round it, is approximately the exact same number. So we see when you change concentrations by adding more moles or more molecules to a flask or removing them, it stays approximately the same. Again, you can look at this, um, here's this animation, and you have the option of adding or removing ions, and you can calculate the change in KEQ. Now, the difficult part of using KEQ is to do this backwards, which means, given KEQ, can we calculate the amount of the substances when they reach equilibrium? So we can use the mole ratio to our advantage because, as we've stated, the rate at which a substance increases or decreases relative to the other substances has to do with the coefficients. And to figure out how much the change is going to be, we can just use a variable such as x. So for example, if we start with 3 moles of H2 in a flask, 6 moles of F2 in a flask, and if the flask is 3 liters in size, we can find out using the molarity equation, knowing that molar concentration is moles per liter, that the concentration initially of H2 is 1 mole, F2 is 2 moles, and we can presume that we're starting with 0 of the HF because it's a product. We know at equilibrium that the graph, when we're graphing a reversible reaction, the graph looks like this. So we can say because we're starting with 2 molar of the F2, we know it's going to decrease by some amount, and we can say that change is going to be X. So we know that H2 and F2 will be used up to make HF, and they're going to decrease by some amount X because the coefficient in the balanced equation is 1 H2 and 1 F2. We can also say that HF is going to increase by twice that amount because its coefficient is 2. So we can set up what's called an ice or a rice table in which you set up the reactants and products, the initial concentrations, and then we can think about how much they are going to change, and we're, we don't know that change, so we're just going to use X in the meantime. We know F2 and H2 are both going to decrease by the same amount, so we'll just say that's X. And we know HF is going to be produced at twice the amount because there is two of them. So we can say at equilibrium, it's going to be some amount 1 moles minus whatever X changes. 2 moles minus X, and 0 moles plus 2X. Let's plug those equations in here for each of the concentrations. We can simplify to get this. We're given in the problem KEQ is equal to this. Using that information, we can simplify to get this expression. We can use the quadratic equation to end up with two different numbers. One is which is rational and one is not. Because we were only given one molar of H2 to start with, 
we can't possibly decrease by 2.13. So x must be 0 0.97. And if you plug that in, you get the final concentrations, or actually we should say the concentrations at equilibrium.